Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia. Welcome back to part 10 of our tutorial series on Total War Three Kingdoms featuring Cao Cao. In this part, we'll be talking about your economy grows, as that bonus has become activated at the start of this turn because we finished our construction of the tax collection building here inside Chen Commandry, and we'll get a nice three-turn bonus if we hover over the bonus section on the top left of your economy grows. That will give us minus 20% construction cost faction wide and minus one turn construction time. And what we did at the end of last part is we have finished conquering a new piece of land to our small budding kingdom. And we got the livestock farm here in Huainan, which we can eventually upgrade. And last turn we saw that this costed us about 1,400 and now it has calmed down due to that bonus being active. And we're going to definitely upgrade this before that bonus expires. But we have three turns. So even if we upgrade this on the third and final turn, it will still enjoy the discount during the duration of its three turn that it will take to construct it. So we pretty much have three turns to put in our build orders and we can enjoy these discounts even if the construction themselves take longer than three turns. We also thought about chasing down this army and we end up discovering that because of the river, we can't. And there was actually a small mistake where we didn't put Sahodun back as the commanding general. Because now we have less movement. You see this bar? It's full 100%. But we mentioned how Sahodun has the reach ability, which gives him 25% extra. Which we can prove here by making him our commanding general. We still have the same exact movement on the map. But you see the bar? the maximum amount of action point we had just went up to 125%. If we had done this switch at the end of turn, last turn, we would have gotten 25% extra movement and perhaps we would have been able to reach Pengcheng this turn. Right now we can't reach it, which is a bit sad, but we'll just be shifting our army towards the livestock farm here as I do want to expand and take Pengcheng rapidly. Now why do we want to take this commandery to add into our collection? Well, commandery and land is always great for building your economy, but most importantly, the goal of capturing Pengcheng is a defensive one, as right now we're at war with a real faction in Taotian due to the event of our father's death. The faction here is the Yellow Turban Rebellions. These are similar to the High Empire as they are sort of passive factions that will not be so aggressive towards you. So during times of peace or even at war with them, they make for pretty decent neighbors. But right now we have a warring faction that will come attack us. And on our frontier with them, we have two livestock farm, which are not such great defensive commanderies to hold on to because the battle map is quite open. As we have shown in the last two battles, it's an open field battle. If we take this, which is a commandery capital, right now it's a level 3 large town, then what we will have is an actual fortified town to defend. So if we could draw the fire of Taotian here, rather than on our more exposed income producing livestock farms, it would be a lot better for us. So because of that, we're going to shift our army towards them. There's another concept that I didn't clarify, and that's about replenishment inside a garrison. So right now you can see we are enjoying 13% replenishment per turn. That's based off our basic replenishment rate of 4%, 5% from the flexibility skill from our commanding general, and lastly 4% from our military supply, which right now is full at 100. If we move that unit into a garrison, it will increase for two reasons. So let's pop in here. And as we arrive, if we hover over again, the first thing that we see is basic replenishment rate has gone up to 6%. So we got a 2% increase to the basic amount. And this basic amount is dependent on whether we are inside a garrison or on the open field. So because we were on the open field before, we had 4%. Now we are inside a garrison, so we're at 6%. You can also see that we have moved from Huainan's commandery to Chen's commandery. Huainan's commandery is not controlled entirely by us. We only have one piece, and this piece is giving us a total of 15k population. 
is very very small and at this population level the only bonus we have is five percent food production no bonus to replenishment if we hover over chen we have a much bigger share of the entire commandery we have a much higher population and we're enjoying 2% additional local replenishment bonus, which is also being applied to the army here. So in this instant where we can see, sort of, there are no enemies nearby, I am not certain there is no enemy from Sapi who could come reach us, but there's a good chance we're safe here for at least a turn. So for the end of this turn, we will stay inside a garrison, and that way we can enjoy 4% extra replenishment for all our units as well as some of our injured generals which will fully heal with this 17%. And if you really want to make sure if Taotian can attack us, there's two things we can consider. One, you see here once again we have a river terrain which is going to shield us from any army moving from this side of the river. They have to find a bridge and the bridge is right here even though it's a little hard to see. You can kind of track the road and find the bridge in the winter, the roads are very, very difficult to spot. You can vaguely see an outline uh, because of the snow coverage. And then the other factor working in our favor is if we double click on Sapi to open up Taotian's faction, you can see that he is also at war with the Yellow Turban Rebellion. Which means if we jump back in here to Hengcheng, which is the holding in between us and Taotian, you see that the zone of influence of Pengcheng covers the bridge. Therefore, if he wants to reach us from this side, then he has to fight through this holding before he can reach us. So unless he had an army already situated on the south side of the river, which is highly unlikely, probably here, he won't be able to reach us because there's also forest terrain here. So things are going to be rather difficult for him to move through. If he had an army hiding here for some reason, then we are in trouble. But we're going to take that gamble and say that he does not have an army randomly on the south side of the river that's kind of protecting Sapi over here. And we'll be proceeding after we heal to take on Pengcheng. Now, we're going to get these cavalry units back next turn. They will come at 7 units, much like how we had them before. And we mentioned how the unit upkeep should not be charged against us last episode, but it seems like that is actually not true and we're still getting charged for them even though we're not able to utilize them, which actually is rather strange because I had vaguely remembered that not being true, but apparently that's not the case. And the display is also weird because you see there are 220 here. So together it should be 440, but because of our armor gives us 15% revenue upkeep discount, we are actually reducing that amount to the 374 that we see. This same bonus is also on Saho Dun's armor, so their revenues are actually discounted. Not everyone's armor have this bonus. So this is part of the idea of know thyself to see your generals and what bonus they can provide your army. So that's something we can worry about next turn as we proceed to this battle. And this episode is pretty much laying out the plan for the next three turns in terms of how we're going to grow our economy by utilizing the bonuses that we get from the mission. And the first thing that we need to take note of is here in Chen, we have a level two, which you can see here, town. This gives us two building slots, four points of prestige, 300k population capacity, which we have already reached. As you can see, we have hit the population limit there. It keeps hovering over. I gotta watch out how I move. So we're already at max. Our building's giving it plus 4k, but it no longer can increase it because we're already at max. Maximum capacity is reached. So if we want to grow our population anymore, we have to upgrade it. If we upgrade it once, we get four more points of prestige. Plus eight is not an eight point increase. It's eight point increase from four. So we're actually getting a four point increase. 400k population capacity, which means we go up by 100k potentially if we can grow it up to 100k. 25 points of peasantry income will come as part of this building. 
25% income from commerce. That's if we have any commerce income, which we do not have. And if you're confused, just hover over the income here and you can see that we have currently 250 peasantry income at 5%. Now you might notice why is it suddenly 5% when the last time we looked at it, it was 56%. Well, that's because we are in winter. So not only do we not have the bonus to peasantry income, we actually lose 25% income from peasantry, even though we are a high fertility commandery. So there is punishment to the season. Winter is particularly harsh. Therefore, we are actually losing some of the bonus that we have from other sources. So we are at only 5% now. This is the low point of our income. And if we upgrade it one more time, we become a small city. This is a huge jump. We briefly mentioned how the small city and small regional city are very key tiers in terms of settlement upgrade. And the reason why is they unlock certain building constructions. But if you notice here from three to four, we have to consume food. There is no penalty on this building. Once we hover over here, you can see the minus two food production as though the small city will consume two food per turn from your food supplies, which we can handle. We have five in reserve right now as a surplus production, but you see other bonuses, another four points of prestige, 800k population, 25 peasantry still the same, 25% from commerce still the same. We get an extra reserve capacity, which increases the bottom number here to give us more supplies in case we get siege at our current supply we can hold out for 20 for six turns here so if we increase it we can hold out for longer and most importantly is the last two bonus that are changed building slots go up to three which means we can construct a third building right now we have two we'll get an empty slot to use and the settlement will have walls so here no wall here wall we will highlight what difference this is once we attack Pengcheng, because Pengcheng is currently level two, a uh, level three, sorry. So they actually do not have walls yet. We are the one that's level two. So if we attack them, I'll show you what a settlement looks like without walls and what are some of the benefits and penalties of that. And we'll also eventually be able to showcase something that's level four that has walls. And we'll also talk about what are some of the benefits and penalties of having a city that has walls. So those are some of the highlights. And why am I talking about settlements in particular? Because this is part of our game plan. The game plan of your economy grows for us is I wanna push our settlement to tier four, a small city as fast as possible. Because if we hover over it, you see that it says here, unlocks a reform. Reform is something we have not talked about yet because it has not become relevant in this campaign. Each faction, if you're playing as a Han faction, will receive a free reform at the beginning of every year, that is during the spring season, which to us is the very next turn. And if we click on this in particular reform that becomes unlocked once we have a small city, it's called Eunuch Secretaries. Left clicking it, will open up our reform panel or reform tree is what I like to call it because it is a beautiful tree. And the current reform that we start out with, it's right here called the regional commissioners. You see the awesome cherry blossom coming up once we select it and more will open up as we unlock them. And the branching of the tree is the branching of the reforms as you have to unlock the previous ones to have access to later ones. There is no research time for the Han factions. This is not true for bandits, yellow turbans, or the southern tribes. They are full-blown reform guides for each of the reform tree in the game from all the DLCs on the channel. I'll put a link to that playlist in the description below. But for the purpose of our goal here, we want the eunuch secretary, which was glowing if we clicked on it. It saves us some effort from finding it. Because otherwise, the other way to access reform is by clicking on the reforms icon here. It will open up the exact same menu. But then, if you're new to the game, you might not know where unique secretaries are. So if we hop back in, go to our goal here, 
click on the reform that it unlocks and you can see that reform will actually glow at the beginning and you can see a little lock button on the bottom these are all reforms that require something for you to have access to them that's why it says unlocked and then you might notice other icons like this soldier next to the lock some don't have it next to the lock but the soldier means this reform will unlock a unit that you can recruit so those are the only two icons that's relevant for reforms in this case we already know the unlock condition is for us to have a level 4 settlement which is incorrectly displayed here in game which is something I just recently noticed. If you hover over the city, it still says small city. But here it says five, when it really should say four. So I will put in a ticket to report this. Hopefully this gets fixed so it doesn't confuse anyone. But the purpose of this is it will unlock two bonuses for you. The first bonus is it will give you one available administrator position. This is my goal. I want an administrator as soon as possible. So this is why I want to focus on this. In addition, we unlock a building, a level three access to a court building. Now we are not that interested in a court building, but this is something that will come with this reform. And on this reform screen here, you can see information about what the focus is as in it's part of the government reform. The reform tree, much like the rest of the game is also color coded. If you pay close attention, this section here, is blue this section here is purple this section here is yellow and this section here is red and finally this section here is green and they all relate to the buildings as in the yellow are the government focused ones the purple are the industry focused ones the blue are commerce focused ones the green are peasantry and farming focused ones and the red are military focused ones so the color coding system is very prevalent throughout the game. And because that's our goal, we are going to focus on upgrading our capital building, the settlement capital, as fast as we can. And there are some difficulties to this. If you take a look at our current situation, the cost of upgrading from level 2 to level 3 is 1,400 copper and 2 turns. This is ready with discounts from the bonus of your economy grows, as well as the discount from supervised construction, which we have placed inside Chen by using Cao Ren, our cousin. So combined, we are actually seeing 30% discount and two turns of savings. That means this originally costed 2,004 turns. So we are saving a huge chunk right now, but still not fast enough. Two turns is too slow. The reason why two turns is too slow is you have to pick your reform in the spring. You can't let it wait. So if we don't have a level four settlement here by next turn, we can't gain access to that reform. So that's one problem we have. We need to speed up our construction, which is possible. Now, if we click this, you see that we're upgrading. There is a money icon under the construction and it says instant construction, a thousand gold. This means we can pay a thousand to complete this building in this instant. Not even short into one turn, but instant construction. This cost will change depending on the base construction cost of the upgrade or the construction, as well as how many turns remaining. So if we wait a turn, this cost will lower to about 500. It's usually half once it goes down from two turns to one turn. So we can wait, but because we're not only upgrading our building from level two to level three, we need it to go to level four by next turn. So if we cancel this real quick and take a look at the options, 1,400 two turns, 2,104 turns. So we not only need to rush this, we also need to rush this and it will be quite pricey to rush something that's four turns. So ideally we pay up for the two turn rush this turn, start this construction, and then we'll pay up for a three turn rush next turn. 
which will cost us in the neighborhood of 1,500, and then another 2,100 on top. So the expense this turn will be 1,400 plus 1,000 for the rush, 2,400 plus a 2,100 to put in the work order, and combine, that's going to be roughly 4,500, which we can afford. We are holding on to about 6,953, and in the case you're short on income, you can always use your food during the winter season to trade in diplomacy and make some money back, which we don't need in this case, as we are making quite a bit because we saved on not only our first building, but also on using a very limited size army in terms of our expansion. Now still, 4,500 to upgrade your settlement twice is maybe not the greatest idea in the world you might think. Why do we want to push for this rapid expansion? Now logically, having an upgraded settlement at least to a small city is a great idea. We push our population limit to 800k here, which if we add in the potential for 500k out of this building, remember right now you can see 800k max, which is 300k here and 500k in the minor settlement. The minor settlement always are 500k if they have population at all. You can hover over to see 500k max. Then 800k plus 500k is 1.3 million. And at 1 million, we gain additional building slot per turn. So that's very helpful. Additionally, if we want to build more buildings, which we do, so they synergize with each other, we have a bunch of flat base peasantry, we might be interested in something that will boost percentage of peasantry income. Therefore, expanding our current base to make more money, then we need another building slot to fit in this building. So that's another consideration. And the reason why we want to rush it, the true reason, or the motivation here, is we captured Yuan Huan on turn 1, which you might have forgotten already, but Yuan Huan here has the agricultural reformer background, and if we use him as administrator, he will give us 30% construction cost discount to all agricultural building or green buildings, and also additional minus 1 construction time to agricultural buildings. So, if we have him as administrator on the next turn, there will be two turns of overlap between his bonus and your economy grows, as well as the assignment, which means we will be saving 20%, 30%, plus another 30% for a total of 60% on all green buildings. And we have a bunch of green buildings. The capital building is not a colored building. Therefore, it will not enjoy this additional 30%. We are upgrading it now because we can't reduce it any farther, and also because we need to upgrade it to unlock the access to administrator. So those are all reasons, because think about it here. This building, a building that we would like to upgrade, has an option that costs 1,855. We can reduce that using Agricultural Reformer, and we can also reduce the turn two turn right now, reduce it by another turn, goes to one turn. Our minor settlement, also a green building, can also be reduced to one turn. So there's potential for us to upgrade all our buildings rather rapidly and save us a bunch of time and also save us a bunch of discount because we have the 20%. So rushing it a bit here isn't going to ultimately hurt us, it's actually going to help us. And we also forgot to mention expertise stat for administrator with also lower construction costs. So it's not even 60% on green buildings, it's potentially 71% on green buildings. So that's huge in terms of savings. And if we can increase this expertise by using items, we can push this even farther. So these buildings will be very, very cheap. Remember their cost now. This is on 30% discount. So let's watch what happens to this price as we proceed with this plan. So that's our goal here. So to implement this goal, now that we have it set, we're going to first build this, and we're going to rush this right away. And then we're going to start building this. And you can see, we can actually afford this four-turn rush right now, but there's no incentive to do so. 
because even if we finish the construction now, we can't have access to the reform until next turn. So let one turn pass, it will drop the price to 1,500, and that way we can utilize a little bit of cheaper instant construction so that we can time everything up correctly. So that's done. We have our army resting up. We have our building going. We can upgrade this because this is not part of the same commandery, so the administrator bonus will not be applied to Huainan. So you can upgrade this whenever you want. My idea here is you want to wait till the last turn of your economy grow to upgrade this. There's a very good reason for this, and that's because if we hover to the fourth upgrade and to the lock, or if you just want to look on the panel here, there's a requirement for the fourth upgrade. There's no requirement on three, there's no requirement on two, no requirement on one. On almost all building chains, once you get to the level four building, there's usually a reform requirement. So revisiting the reform tree, we see that if we want the level four building, we need to take this resettlement incentive. And that's probably the better option if you didn't capture Yuan Huan on turn one, as the administrator would be less useful for you because you don't have the perfect guy ready in your faction. Then maybe taking this for 3K population growth in all your counties faction wide every turn for the rest of your game, which is actually super strong, and you also have access to a level four livestock farm. So that is an option you could take, and then you can upgrade both of your livestock farm multiple times. And in that situation, you wouldn't even be rushed to upgrade this and rush it, and you just be upgrading your buildings normally, pick up that reform so you can go from two to four, which will increase your income, increase your food. So those are all good news. So with that said, uh, because we are rushing buildings and we're having large expense in that avenue, we're not going to be upgrading this until the final turn of your economy grows. That way we can have it just drift for the next three turns, take the maximum amount of discount, and also have the least impact on our wealth when we need our wealth the most right now. And you might think we're pretty much done. We looked at both of our commanderies, we looked at our building options, our army options, army has finished moving, and that's pretty true. We are pretty much done. There is one thing you should always consider at every turn is you can take a look at the diplomacy screen. This is a very good habit to do. And here we can see attitudes, which is a pretty good sign. You have some green factions to a direction where we're not fighting and we have some enemies over here. There's a couple things to consider here on this screen is what we want to do going ahead. We want to continue this trend, obviously. And if we hover over this sort by attitude, you can see attitude trending. And you can see they're trending as in they're growing. So we should be staying friends with them. And if there's anyone in particular we might want some money from, or if we want to make sure that the trend is going to stay positive, we can make a true trade, which is something we have talked about quite a bit. And given our starting location, we are playing as Halt Halt. We have a bunch of green farmland counties near us. Livestock farm, livestock farm, farmland, and then over here we have the farmland piece of Chen. Down here we have another farmland piece. So food is something that's a plenty for us. Therefore, we should trade it for wealth because other factions might have more access to industry or commerce and they might not have so much food. And holding on this five food, although it's nice for the 5% increase to peasantry, it will still have that bonus as long as we are net positive and it doesn't need to be at five. So we're going to trade some away. And whenever you trade some away, always consider, do you have any unforeseen expenses coming up in terms of our upgrade, which we actually do. We are going to actually increase our food consumption by two next turn. So don't trade all five away or you go negative. Even though you can also consider other things, we're likely to upgrade this. We'll go from two food to three food here. So one more food here. This will likely get upgraded for one more food. This will also likely get upgraded for one more food. So we have three food coming in, two food going out in the next few turns. We should be okay. So pop open diplomacy, and we're gonna have a chat with Yuan Shao, who is one of our best friends right now in terms of current attitude, but he's also a very powerful lord in the north and a historical rival with us in the future. So we're going to watch out for him. He's one of the playable factions, as you can see by his art. Um, Liu Chong is someone who we are already trading food to. 
once you have one food deal in place, you can't do it again until it times out. So he's out of the picture for this. Yuan Shao here only have a non-aggression pack with us. So we can actually trade with him. And because we have this deal with him, we can see his actual stats. He has net positive 7 food, which means he doesn't need food that badly. And he also has only 2,396 in his treasury right now. It's about the same as us. And what we're going to do here is offer him food. Whenever you're offering food, first thing to do is put it to 1 just to see what the baseline is. 1.5 is actually very good. If you see 1.1, then give up on the idea. It's just not worth it. And here we're getting 5 points or 0.5 points per food. And let's see how long that stays. Uh, at 4, you see the extra food here only marginally increase our diplomatic points by 0.1. So we can stop at 3, which is actually pretty optimal for us because we're about to drop in terms of 2 food next turn. So let's give him 3 for 2.5 and let's see how much he's willing to pay for this. So we could ask him for items. Oh, he actually has an unequipped item, but it's silver, so it's quite expensive. And also it's not that important for us to get this piece. It's a primary green armor. If you remember, we are a faction of a lot of unique generals. So their armor are not equippable, as you can't remove them and can't swap them. So getting a silver one is not as good for us. He has placed everything else on his journal, so there's actually no item to be had. Then it comes down to money. And we already mentioned this, you should check both at all times to see which one is better. In this case, I can pretty much guess per turn is going to be better, because he has so little treasury here. So I'm guessing he might give us maybe an eighth of that. He's more generous than I give him credit for, but not that much more. So we're looking at about 443 instant cash. And if you need instant cash, then this might be your only option. But as you can see, it's not even as good as 10 turns of 50, which can be increased, I'm sure, quite a bit. I'm going to guess 160 ish. Close. 176 is too much. Oh, I completely mistyped that. 172. 70. Ooh, 171. So that's the max amount. He, he's making 1,439 per turn. It's not that much, uh, you know, compared to the total uh, in terms of the ratio, right? You know, this is closer to 1 8th. This is about 1 7th, 1 6th, 1 6th, a little less than 1 6th. So obviously, this is going to be easier for him to swallow, even though it's a lot more money. Right? The ratio comparison and the actual raw value is not what's being compared. So in this case, we'll take the 1,710 copper over 10 turns rather than the directly 443. Just cancel that one out. He will agree to this. There is no attitude change here because we already have some sort of deal and he's not really getting any favors here. If we, for example, gives him a few extra points, maybe... Maybe he will be happy, but I highly doubt it. We talked about the thresholds of 0 points, 5 points, and 15 points. So at this point, we're okay with this. What this does is give us income and also lock him up for 10 turns to not think about performing any hostile actions towards us. Now, of course, you might say he's our best friend right now compared to everyone else. There's really no incentive for him to attack us. But if you play the game a couple times, you know the conflict between Yuan Shao and Cao Cao is pretty unavoidable and historical references will tell you the same, so you might as well lock him up in the food dependency situation, give him a bunch of food, encourage the AI to upgrade their cities excessively, because cities cost food, and therefore they'll be dependent on it, on your food production, and you can control how much you upgrade your own capital so that you don't have, you know, excess spending, and you don't rely on your diplomacy for your food supply. So let's put this order in, 1,710 copper is definitely a great income addition to us. And we're good. We have two food left over, which is just enough. And we can proceed on with the next turn. So let's go. Alrighty. The army is called and Cao Cao looks to lead. This is our unit mission that we briefly covered 
in our last tutorial episode. We got this after we conquered this land, after we triggered your economy growth. It's part of the early tutorial mission chain. This basically teaches you how to recruit new units. And the bonus for this, we didn't really take a detailed look at it, is increased experience points for all your units per season for three turns. 50 points is very little. If you remember how much experience the general needed to upgrade from rank three to uh, four, it's about 8,000. So 150 barely makes a dent here, uh, but still nice. And most importantly, you get three turns of 10% extra replenishment, which will help your units level up. Now, how do we trigger this when we didn't recruit units? Well, remember how we had some injured units? They are not considered your units until you have them come back from being wounded. And this turn they did. Therefore, they triggered it by increasing our unit count by two. And that pushed us over. You need to increase your unit by two for that mission. It will take your current number of units and ask you to recruit two more. That's how that mission works for all factions. Here we get our next mission, which is teaching us to expand. And it's asking us to hold three. Because if we follow the tutorial, we would have only taken this, but not this. In this case, we already done it. So you see the check mark. It will just refresh and tell us we did it. And the reward for this is increasing our credibility. This is something we have not talked about because credibility is our faction unique resource. I have tried to make this guide as generalized as possible since we are only picking one of the factions to play. But eventually we'll talk about Cao Cao's credibility resource, which is the bar underneath here. It goes from zero to 100. It's very, very useful and very, very strong. It's also a passively increasing resource as in it will grow every turn. You see three turn growth per turn when we're in this first tier dictated by this line here. We're currently in the second tier, which drops to plus two points of recovery every turn. And then if we're in the third tier, it's plus one point. So it's a slowly increasing resource. The more you have it, the slower the growth is, and you can use them in chunks. This is a 25 point threshold. This is a 75 point threshold. You can use it in chunks of 25 or chunks of 75 for purposes like triggering proxy wars, or using to manipulate diplomatic attitude. We will utilize this once this hits 75. So let's just know that we're going to get five points boost per turn for three turns or 15 points if we finish this mission, which we automatically have finished already. Just have to close this out and you see, ah, you already have three settlements. Congratulations. Here's your reward. And we get our next mission. There are a huge chain of tutorial missions to help you out. And this teaches you how to send characters on assignments, which we have also done as Tolerant is currently on assignment. And you can see this is another three turns of plus five credibility. And when the reward is the same, what happens is, as you can hover over here, you already see it's being activated. You get six turns of it instead of three turns and three turns. You don't get three turns of plus 10, you get six turns of plus five. The turns will stack when the reward is the same. And it checks you have someone on assignment. Good for you. Here's your credibility increase. And this way we can get there pretty quickly. We're at 49. We get two turns passively and then five from that. And we also get a little bit from faction rank. So we'll get there quick and then we'll talk about how to use that very soon. And then we get our next mission. This is the final tutorial mission. And this says reach a faction rank of second marquees. This is something we have avoided talking about as well. The reward is similar, but six turns. So you can actually push this up to 12 turns with your tutorial mission. Very kind of the developer to give Cao Cao so many bonuses to his unique resource. But it basically asks us to rank up our faction and the bar here represent our current prestige. Prestige we already seen comes from the capital buildings or the capitals of the minor settlements and the major settlement. As you upgrade them, there's prestige on them. That's basically a reflection of how strong your faction is. Not in terms of military strength, but just in terms of development. And when you're highly developed, have a lot of prestige, your faction will rank up. We also have an event, which we'll talk about very soon. Um, let's not do anything here. Uh, we can't click anything else while the event's active, but I can talk about it. The typical way of getting administrator or additional trade routes or access to spies, access to tax rates happens when you rank up. The more authority your leader has, the more thing he can do. We're bypassing that because we need 50 points of prestige, which if you think about it, it's a lot of settlements. Minor ones right now give us five, major ones give us four, eight, 12. We don't have that much land. 
So the only way for us to bypass that to get our first administrator is to get that reform, which we'll do very shortly. And here we can see we have an event. This is exclusive to Cao Cao based on history. And a young administrator in your camp by the name of Yue Jin has gone above and beyond the requirements of his station unprompted. He has recruited a thousand fresh troops from his hometown to join your cause. And we have a choice of not promoting him. If we don't promote him, we get a bonus to replenishment because he brought men in. Or we can elevate him. He becomes a general for us. We pay him a salary, which is very normal. We pay everyone salaries in our faction if they're not our family. And we still get increased replenishment. So clearly, this is the best thing to do. Because the worst outcome here is you don't like him, you fire him. You don't have to pay anything. So this is a no-brainer. And plus, Yue Jin is a unique general in the game. So we definitely want to grab him. And this is the advantage of playing one of the major factions in the game. And by major factions, I mean factions that eventually historically went on to become the Three Kingdoms. Therefore, they have a larger share of historical powerful characters and you get them through these events. So we're going to elevate him. And we can come over to the menu. You see we have a new character, Yue Jin. He is given the background title, The Lion of Yangping, which clearly is a unique title. You can look at the points, he gets 30 points here. Resiliency, a faction-wide bonus if he's Prime Minister era faction leader of 15% to melee damage for melee infantry. That bonus is not that great. Uh, he's level one, zero experience out of 3,000. He's a Sentinel character, which we already have one. We have Cao Ren, uh, but he has good stats. Already one stat over 100 points. You can see his skill tree. He comes with a unique armor. No great bonuses on this armor, a very default armor. 55 is kind of the default armor rating, and then 18 points of expertise is kind of the default stat you get in your primary stat. He does come with a weapon, which is going to help us because this weapon adds 12 points of expertise, and we're about to get our first administrator. So that's going to be very key. Now, administrators is something that we'll cover in the next part. It will take us a while to get through this three turns of your economy grows, uh, but we are going to wrap up our episode here as we enter this turn what we're going to do next is in our next part we will pick our reforms we'll set up our administrators talk about how to pick out administrators and we already kind of mentioned why we want him but even after we install him in the position we will talk about what items to give them how to set up the skill tree for different administrators of different class and then we'll fight this battle here in Pengcheng so that we can have this piece of land as the battleground between us and Tao Tian. Because my goal here against Tao Tian is to stall out for a peace deal. We can, and you know, it's definitely a viable option to wipe him out through this war. He has a few holdings. You have these two here. You can see neither one are his capital, right? No star. Star is capital. He has more land behind. And in total, his land are not worth that much. If you look on Sapi, it's a small commandery with only one county, and it's a farmland county, which is the type of county we didn't take because it doesn't produce any income. So this is not a wealthy commandery. Even Pengcheng is not a wealthy commandery because the additional building is something called a temple. It's very unique. It's the only commandery that's temple in the game. It's quite cool to have, but for us, we don't really need it. And the reason why we're really not interested in conquering his land is there's no income and it will leave us exposed to other factions in this region. I like to limit the amount of vision we have on the map, which also limits the amount of vision enemies have on us or potential enemies. And we're going to actually push our expansion south because if you know anything about the game, the south is where all the wealthy commanderies are. So we'll try to push for that plan. And one of our goals is this commandery here that has been renamed to Danyang in the city of Jianye. It was previously called Jianye Commandery, but with the 1.6 update, it has corrected itself to the historical commandery name of Danyang. And we're going to try to make this our main development zone here. So our desired direction of, of expansion is down south towards this. So our goal in this war is just a piece. So that's going to be what we're going to focus on in our next tutorial. There's a bunch of new things to look at at the beginning of this turn as we jump into that episode in the future. New items, new characters to recruit. So a lot of things exciting up ahead. 
Hopefully you guys enjoy this and see you guys next time. Bye.